hi guys welcome or welcome back to my channel my name is Ksenia and I make videos for people who like myself are going through the family immigration process I'm not an immigration attorney my videos are based on publicly available information my own experience and the experience of my subscribers and the purpose of my channel is to give you guys the confidence to go through this process completely on your own in today's video however we're not talking about family immigration instead I will be answering additional questions in regards to the form I-134 a. I already have two videos regarding this form. The first video is simply a step-by-step -step guide on how to complete this form and in the second video I answered some of the most common questions that I have received. I definitely suggest that you check out the links under my video where USCIS has posted answers to additional questions in regards to this form. So the first question relates to the processing times. Of course, it is one of the most common questions that I receive. In regards to the processing times, USCIS explains that the US government set a limit of 30,000 paroles per month from the eligible countries from Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela and Haiti and at this time there is no limit on the number of approvals for Ukrainian applicants. USCIS also explains that about half of all submitted cases are selected at random for review regardless of when they were submitted and then the second half of cases are reviewed on a first come first serve basis each month. In addition once the form I-134A is confirmed, it is very important that the beneficiary completes all the necessary additional steps, such as uploading their photographs, uploading any additional documents that they require, and signing the attestations on their USCIS account, as well as the CBP app. So the sooner you're able to complete all of these steps, the sooner you will be able to have your travel authorization approved. If your case is taking longer than expected, USCIS recommends that you do not submit a duplicate of the form I-134A for the same beneficiary because it tends to slow things down. However, they do allow you to submit a new I-134A form with more additional evidence if they reject your previously submitted I-134A form. The second very common question I receive is about the income requirements for this form. USCIS has finally issued a somewhat clear statement um, that they do not specifically look for a particular income for this form from the supporter. However, they do rely on the federal poverty guidelines posted by the Department of Health and Human Services. In other words, they do not use the same guidelines as for the forms I-864 affidavit of support or the form I-134 for fiance cases. They do, however, consider the supporter's household size including the beneficiaries that they are vetting to support based on the general federal poverty levels. And they do put a link to the federal poverty guidelines on this page as well. They also specify that they will not consider the income and the assets of the beneficiary. So in the sections where they ask about the beneficiary's income and assets, I would personally simply indicate zero to avoid any confusion, especially because USCIS does not consider beneficiaries income and assets whatsoever. Okay, the next question relates to the number of applications each supporter must submit and how many USCIS accounts must the beneficiary have. So firstly, USCIS does state that a supporter must submit a separate I-134A form for each beneficiary, including the minor children. However, the primary beneficiary can create only one USCIS account and add their spouse and unmarried minor children as travel companions in their travel group. Each minor child and the spouse of the primary beneficiary do not need to create their own separate USCIS account. 
all the additional documents, photographs, and attestations about vaccination, etc., can be performed in one USCIS account of the primary beneficiary. Before you are able to add any travel companions in your group, you first need to make sure that their form I-134A has been confirmed, in other words, approved. So you need to first coordinate with the supporter who submitted these forms to make sure that they have received an email confirmation about the form I-134 34A being approved for each beneficiary. The next question relates to the immigration status of the supporter. USCIS specifies that anyone who currently holds a lawful status in the United States may be eligible to be a supporter, which includes U.S. citizens and nationals, lawful permanent residents, even conditional permanent residents, non-immigrants in lawful status, such as anyone who is currently holding a non-immigrant visa in the United States, as well as people who have asylum, temporary protected status, people who are paroled into the US, and people who are on DACA or DED. USCIS also specifies that even if your temporary protected status is currently in the process of renewal, you still may be eligible to be a supporter. Who is not eligible to be a supporter? Are the people who are in a pending TPS or pending asylum status. If you have any additional questions in regards to your immigration status as a supporter, check out these Q&A pages as well. Next, you need to keep in mind that each beneficiary must have a valid unexpired passport in order to receive a travel authorization. The travel authorization is valid for 90 days, so for three months. And if for any reason the beneficiary is unable to enter the US within that 90 day period, the supporter must follow specific steps on their USCIS account to submit a one time extension request for travel. Keep in mind that this extension request cannot be submitted earlier than 30 days before the original expiration date of this travel authorization and also cannot be submitted past the 30 days after the original authorization has expired. And finally, let's talk about what to do if you believe you made a mistake on the form I-134A. So USCIS does say that if you would like to correct a mistake that you have made, you need to do so in your USCIS account by sending a secure message to USCIS. Again, they do outline these steps on these pages, so check them out. In some cases, you may simply be able to correct the mistake by sending a secure message, and in other cases, you may be asked to provide additional documents. Again, it depends on the type of mistake you have made, and they do outline those on the pages that I'm referencing in this video. So I hope that you found this video useful. Again, if you didn't get an answer to your particular question, please check out my first two videos in regards to this form and the resources from USC that I will also link under my video. I wish you luck in the entire process. If you feel so inclined, please subscribe to my channel and I hope to see you guys in my next videos. Bye!